Hello, so we're going to actually talk a little bit about zoo veterinary medicine um, and a lot of this is based on anesthesia and just treating these animals um, with some of the things that um, they see in anesthesia um, on these guys. Um, this is actually it was done during one of my anesthesia classes. I had one of my old students come in. Um, and she's an old uh, co-worker and friend of mine too. So um, she's actually going to be speaking with um, our vt &E prep group um, too coming up shortly. So um, you may be able to talk to her in um, some extent of uh, Zoom medicine and ask questions as well. So, um, but she has a lot of really great experience um, from working at two different zoos um, and, and just... Um, was able to to give a lot of perspective on different animals that she's been able to treat um, as well. So um, I'm just going to give just a little bit of, of what I've learned from her um, to you guys today. So um, so a little bit about her is that she she came from um, kind of a different uh, area of, of an um, route. Um, she, she ended up Got, um, right out of school going, or I should say high school, going to Northern Illinois University um, and not really knowing exactly what she wanted to get into. Um, she ended up going to a two-door college, um, just kind of figure, trying to figure out where what she wanted to do. Um, and then she finally decided after she um, took a job at Petco um, that she really wanted to get into veterinary um, medicine somehow. So she ended up going to Joliet Junior College in Illinois, um, which has a great um, veterinary technology program. Um, that's where I went to school too. Um, and she uh, became a veterinary technician. So I should say in the meantime, she got a job at Petco and then she ended up working in a, a emergency critical care. Um, that's where I met her. Um, and really grew as a technician, and that's when she actually went to a technician school. Um, and on her externship, she worked um, at a, a Willowbrook Wildlife Center, um, which is kind of um, in the outskirts of uh, Chicago, um, and got a lot of experience and fell in love with you know, all the different species that are out there, and that's kind of where she decided to take her career, um, was in zoo medicine, wildlife, that kind of stuff. So um, from there, you know, um, ended up just trying to find a job in, in zoo medicine. So, um, and she's really grown from there. So um, she she has her, her dog, Jack, um, that she adopted from Jolly Junior College. Um, he's in your picture there too. So, um, so that's Sherry. Um, but she put this together to really talk about what she does on her daily day-to-day -day in zoo medicine. Um, and she actually has a bunch of cases that she wanted to talk about. So I thought this was really good for you guys to kind of see a little bit about zoo medicine. Um, the similarities that we see every single day on our jobs in working in small animal medicine or exotics, um, but also the differences um, that that they do. Um, and then the conservation and medicine aspect of things, which I personally live um, and then, you know, the enrichment aspects of things, which I love as well, and you guys will get to know um, with me, too, is that, you know, it is our job as well to do that enrichment um, with our patients, even if we do see them for only 30 minutes out of the day, um, to try to get them to, in, in, to enrich their lives while we are seeing them, um, because it makes every single time we see them so much easier um, rather than them dreading to see us. They remember um, those those bad moments um, and they also remember the really good moments. So try to make their experience um, really good. So um, so on the day-to-day -day basis if you're working in zoo medicine, obviously you're filling medications or giving injections and stuff like that to sick animals. Um, you're maintaining and servicing any type of equipment that you are utilizing. Um, it is really different. Um, you're not necessarily um, seeing patients that are coming into you. You have to go out to them quite a bit. Um, you're going to have to process a lot of lab work. Um, and a lot of the lab work that you're doing is going to be um, in-house looking at it um, and then sending out certain things. Um, 
you know, obviously restraint and blood draws and stuff like that, IV catheters, recording anesthesia, that kind of stuff. Um, and it's not necessarily a lot of procedures every single day. Um, there's a lot of recording um, and making sure that you have those procedures lined up. There's a lot of paperwork that goes along with it. So it takes a really long time to get those things set up. So doing a lot of that stuff um, ahead of time um, is really good. So that organizational aspect of things is really important. Um, anything that essentially dies within the uh, zoo, it has to have a necro necropsy. So say you have a bird that flies into the zoo um, and just dies there, you have to necropsy it. So um, the vet techs that are there, they get to necropsy those things um, and take a look at everything. So it's kind of a nice thing to be able to um, get to do those things, but um, I'm sure after a while uh, it, it can be a little bit um, cumbersome. Um, but you get to help with those kinds of, of things as well. So um, uh, if you guys ever get to do any type of behind the scenes, it's kind of um, nice to be able to look at the, the um, hospital end of that. Um, you are in charge of obviously ordering things, um, medications, supplies, doing inventory, all of that, um, entering blood work, putting things in um, medical records like cytology results, stuff to that effect, um, assisting anyone that needs help. So um, also helping teach keepers um, medical um, things like, you know, tube feedings, any type of feeding thing, um, also teaching them on how to give medications. Um, keep in mind, the keepers have a huge, um, they do a lot of the enrichment, they have a huge relationship with all of those animals, so many times they are the ones that are going to be giving a lot of these treatments to um, these animals, and so teaching them um, a lot of this stuff is really important. So. It is our job a lot of times to do that type of education to them. Um, yes, we are going to be helping them, but um, they are a huge asset to the, um, the, the quality of life that these animals have. So um, managing um, any specialists and stuff like that that are there. Um, yes, the, we have a lot of uh, doctors that come in. Um, they come in out, outside of the zoo hospital, um, so making sure that everything is set up for those um, doctors that do come in and so that we can make their lives a lot easier is really important. Um, coordinating any type of animal pickups or returns, um, making sure, again, that everything um, works out okay, so, you know, communication is really, really key. And ICU care, um, you know, taking care of any animals that are sick or quarantined, um, set up, clean up of everything. Um, so organizational sales, again, it's really, really key. Um, sterilization of equipment. So just like any hospital, making sure everything's sterilized um, and ready to go. Um, training animals for medical behaviors and things like that, which you'll see later on in the presentation. Um, so again, teaching those animals that, working with trainers um, and, and everything. It's part of the enrichment and it's also going to be really helpful for being able to do those medical procedures. So um, they've come such a long way with being able to treat these um, behaviors, or, or I'm sorry, for medical treatment and everything um, so that they don't have to sedate animals for everything, um, which has saved a lot of time and has also been um, so much safer for those animals that we don't have to sedate them for everything. Writing protocols, which everyone I know loves to do, but um, they have to have a protocol for everything that you do. So any, um, you know, any procedure that's going to be done, anything that you are going to do for training. So say like the one above. So we're training for a medical behavior that's going to happen. They have to write a protocol for it, and then it has to be approved, um, whether it's for iCook. Um, so if you guys learned about iCook and then also for the USDA, that's going to have to be approved. So writing these protocols ahead of time before you're going to enforce it, um, that has to have a protocol. So it is a lot of work um, to write these protocols. Um, assisting with veterinary residents, interns, and externs. So um, these guys that come in, um, we kind of have to, uh, of course, um, 
you know, help them, guide them, watch over them, um, and also um, empower them as well to learn. Um, so it is, again, we're, we have, wear multiple hats um, in, in this field. So um, continuing education is also incredibly important. So whether or not we are um, going to conferences, learning more, and then also at this stage too, um, at some point we also are giving continuing education, right? So we're going and doing lectures. Uh, we are writing, um, you know, journals. We are then, um, you know, doing research um, opportunities. So once you start getting into um, a greater part of your career, um, it is time where you kind of take that plunge and go, okay, maybe I will um, try to lecture at a conference. Um, I will try to do a peer review um, journal, you know, or I'll, I'll be a contributor to a book, you know. Um, so that's part of that continuing education. Also working with the budgeting um, for the zoo as well, and then also working at safety. Um, so quarantine, so common procedures that we do is quarantine and annual exam. So everyone gets an annual exam and then, you know, new animals that come in or leave have to be quarantined before they go out. Um, so just making sure that everyone is kind of scheduled accordingly. Um, where, where they're getting x-rays, blood work, ultrasound, UA, all of that. Um, and then they're getting their annual exam. Um, sometimes um, they do less frequently um, depending on the animal. Um, also doing roundups for certain animals too, so it just kind of depends, so that way you can kind of look at them, um, you know, like flamingos, squirrel monkeys, goats, um, vultures, stuff like that. Um, they also have some animals on birth control, so um, you'll have to check on those guys, so implants or injections, it just kind of depends. Um, other procedures that are done are root canals, extractions. Um, when I did my dental externship, uh, when I was in school, uh, we did a root canal on a lion at one of our local zoos. Um, so they pulled in a dental specialist um, that I worked with, um, and, and he worked on small animals, um, but they pulled him in and a bunch of other um, specialists to come work on the lion um, at our zoo. So um, that was kind of fun to be a part of. Um, a lot of times they do field procedures because they can't bring those big animals in. So they take all of their equipment and bring it out into the field and, you know, they, they create as much of a clean environment as possible. Um, animal moves. So if you guys ever see animal moves, they, they are really, really intense. Um, and having to really um, figure that out ahead of time, like how they're actually going to move these big animals, so like a crane and an all of this stuff um, can be uh, a huge plan session beforehand. And other things too, like euthanasias, obviously um, can, just like everything else, um, it's, it's hard. It's hard to deal with. Everyone gets really close with these animals um, that they work with every single day. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there's, you know, we, the animals that we care for um, in in our um, zoo um, and everything, sometimes they we can't do anything else to um, make their quality of life better, and so we do have to euthanize them um, at some point. And so um, there are um, euthanasias, so um, that can be really difficult. As well. So. Where do other animals go? Obviously, um, we trade animals through other institutions, um, many times for breeding. And, um, you know, some people are like, why, why do they work on, like, all this breeding stuff? Obviously, it's for conservation. Um, it's to keep a lot of animals. Um, obviously, we have many animals who are on, um, you know, the watch list. Um, there's many animals who are in, in the areas where the, we work scared they're going to go extinct so i'm um, trying to conserve you know the the population of them and so um that is a huge reason why we have them breeding um and, and we really want to keep that um 
keep those animals going. So um, that is a huge reason why we send them to other institutions. Um, we want to keep educating uh, people in zoos about conservation. Um, yes, uh, you know, there are individuals who don't like zoos um, and uh, there, there are some issues with certain zoos and stuff like that and trying to make zoos um, more um, uh, a nicer institution for the animals. Um, but overall, uh, the, the enrichment programs um, and what the overall common goal is for zoos um, is to better the livelihood for these animals um, as well. So um, the more that people learn about zoos um, and can contribute to the zoos to make everything better, um, I think the better that the zoos can end up being long term. Um, so quarantine in the holding area for these guys, um, it's, it's when we are bringing them in to make sure that these animals are safe, um, to put them out with everyone else. Um, and same thing goes for when they're going to be sent to another institution. It's so that the doctors can check them out to make sure that they are healthy. Um, and then they can go out with everyone else and uh, introduce them appropriately. So just like if you were to get a kitten, um, they want to introduce them in an appropriate fashion. So um, also exhibits when they're getting remodeled, um, they have holding areas too so that they can move them appropriately. Um, so they also have that. And then um, how are they moved, obviously? So they do work on training as well um, to get them to move accordingly. Um, and so I've seen that, um, which is kind of a, a fun um, aspect of how they do that. Um, I've seen them try to do elephants, which is really funny. They don't sedate elephants to move them. Um, but elephants are incredibly stubborn, so that goes um, <laughs> very interesting. Um, but a lot of times they do train them really well. If they have to, um, obviously they do sedate them. Um, one um, thing that they have done, I watched a manatee be um, moved, and they had to use a crane, and obviously half, they can't train a manatee to move out of water and move so they did have to just use a crane and pick up the manatee to move it um, but they had to use a crane and that was really interesting um, and a slightly scary because they just used a crane and just wheeled him over to a whole different section but um, it, it is it is pretty crazy how they they just move these huge animals um, quickly so um, but Remember that sedation and anesthesia um, and antholytics too is also to help these animals not freak out as well. So, so common drugs, right, um, that we can use on some of these animals, um, they also use some of these drugs that maybe we don't necessarily see on our day-to-day -day basis because as you guys know, we would have to give them a crazy amount of these drugs and some of these drugs may not work out entirely well. Um, so there are certain drugs that are really, really potent. And the reason for that is that some of these animals are in really, really big. So um, my understanding is that um, we have this ultra potent right, narcotic that's used. Um, and um, my old student was telling me that they use um, carfentanil. Um, and when they do use this, um, that, and I have actually heard that they have found carfentanil actually on the street before, which is really, really scary. Um, but it is incredibly um, potent. But when they give this to, I uh, you know, like gorillas and stuff, they actually have to suit up fully um, just in case they get any carfentanil on them. Um, and then the other person who is not carrying carfentanil, they actually have um, um, naloxone on them um, so that they can give naloxone to that person in case it does get on them because this will absolutely kill a human being. Um, so uh, that way they can give it nasally and hopefully um, get that to them right away. Um, so um, Anything that um, is really extra potent for them, they can go ahead and give them. Um, other drugs that obviously that they give um, 
would be like ketamine, um, metatomidine, dexmedetomidine, mainly dexmedetomidine on that end, um, xylazine, right, telazole. Um, MS-222 is um, for fish, obviously. So what they do with fish is they pour MS-222 in the water, and then they put oxygen in that water as well. Um, and how they do that is they pour just a little bit in at first. Um, if it doesn't make the fish fall asleep, they put a little bit more in. Um, and that's how they maintain uh, you know, the level of anesthesia. Now, if the fish gets too sedate, then they put in more water um, to dilute out the MS-222 um, to lighten the anesthesia. So it's like this huge playing game with fish, right? To see which, what, how much anesthesia they need to really put in. So um, fish anesthesia is very interesting. Um, so they also use cocktails, just like, you know, with small animal. Um, and they have their reversals as well. So anapamazole, naloxone, and um, telazolone. Um, they can supplement if they need to as well. Say they need to add in something else as well if it's not working enough. Um, so whether or not they are just doing like a sedation, say they're out in the field, they may use, you know, like a ketamine, um, midazolam, dexmedetomidine. Um, just to kind of knock them out for a little bit, or a telazole, um, and, uh, you know, midazolam, buprenorphine. Um, it just kind of depends. Um, if they are, like, spelled propofol, <laughs> um, but if they, but if they need to bring out gas anesthetic, they will as well. Um, so the ultra-potent drugs, um, are usually a class two, um, controlled substance, um, and, they are typically used on um, non-domestic, like bovine species. Um, and she said that they also have used them on, like I said, gorillas, um, larger animals, like really large animals. Um, and there's a high margin of safety with the high concentration um, if they use like a really small volume, obviously. And it's rapid acting, so that's the nice part. Um, and they typically reverse it with their naloxone, um, so that's good. And so, um, in anesthesia, 60 to 90 percent of their cases are usually anesthetized, um, and so uh, they all they do have to pay special attention for diving animals. Um, so she she definitely talked about this um, quite a bit. Um, she talked about seals and otters. They I had a lot of issues with initially um, when they were um, starting to anesthetize um, seals, especially. Um, they were going; they weren't sure, obviously, how to maintain them on um, anesthesia, right? Um, and so they were maintaining them with their CO2 level at 35 to 45, just like regular animals. And so they were finding that, yes, under anesthesia, they were doing fine, but they were trying to wake them up. Um, but they weren't waking up appropriately. A lot of them were dying. Um, and they were finding that they actually need to ventilate at a higher rate um, at 60 to 90 millimeters of mercury. And so they actually have a diving response where they um, adapt better to holding their breath underwater. Um, and so they just hold their breath for longer periods of time. So we just need to ventilate them um, like that uh, for longer when they're when they are under anesthesia. So um, they actually do a lot better. They woke up a lot nicer um, and less complications. Um, so unfortunately, these are our um, you know learning experiences that we go through um, while they're under anesthesia. So kind of like how we were talking about fish anesthesia too. So we use MS-222 and then a little bit of sodium bicarbonate. Um, we have our oxygen reader and our pH um, meter as well. Um, so they have several pools. They have a, a normal water pool and an MS-222 water. And then our water, or I'm sorry, our water work table. So the water work table is where you then are able to utilize it's like a short 
a shorter pool, you're able to do what you need to do, obviously, in that. So whether you're doing ultrasound or um, you need to um, do any, any type of thing, x-rays, that kind of thing. Um, and then your normal water is for them to recover in, right? So basically, oh, sorry. Basically, well, let me go back. Your, um, your anesthesia is, um, oh, I'm sorry. Basically, you're only able to monitor the respiration rate, right? We're not able to hook up ECG leads. We really can't, um, we're not intubating them, right? Because you can't. Um, and there's there's no other options like you can't put an SpO2 really on them right there's there's no other thing so we only for fish we're only able to monitor respiratory rate on them um, throughout that time so it's very very different when we're monitoring a fish under anesthesia so some other field procedures that are done many times are radiographs um, and so again they have to bring everything out um, for radiographs and you have to get really really uh, I say MacGyver everything so as you'll see here I'm holding up um, their radiograph machine um, they have to make sure that they know how to angle everything appropriately right so she has to hold her uh, machine at an appropriate angle for this tiger um, they also have to bring out um, their in the middle screen here, they're going to be doing an endoscopy. So they bring out all their endoscopy equipment. They have their surge vet with them. They have, you know, just all of their computers and all of that with them to do that field study. And then the on the last picture here, he wanted to make sure that he had an appropriate angle. He's not going to be able to carry that appropriately, so he has it attached to a nice board as well, so a four by four board, um, so that he can. Um, make sure that it's at an appropriate angle to look at that shoulder on that calf. So, um, so yeah, they get really, really uh, smart about things. So in this picture here um, is a tortoise um, that they were taking some radiographs of. So um, they put their board up um, of this tortoise's leg. I believe he ended up having, um, he had a like, this got crushed somehow. Um, I forgot how she said it was crushed. Um, and this individual would definitely put gloves on normally. <laughs> and I won't get into that, but they're just holding up that plate so they can get a nice view. Um, and this other person would probably have a gown on in the back as well, we would hope. But um, I'm not going to pick on them too much. Um, but they're taking just a radiograph to see what this looks like first. Um, and then they would be able to decide whether or not they're going to bring this tortoise in um, and go from there. So um, they're just taking that radiograph um, as well. And then here was just a, um, this is obviously in the field um, of orangutan uh, where Sherry is right here on the, the right hand side. Um, she's placing an IV catheter. Um, they have a blood pressure going. Everyone is looking. I think they were doing an ultrasound at that given moment. Um, and the ECG leads are on. Um, they have the surge event in the background, as you can see. Um, and they're preparing just uh, obviously a procedure, but again, they have to bring everything out um, in the, the field with them. Um, granted, you could see they're all wearing masks here. Um, this is before COVID, but the reason why they're wearing masks here is because this is a rantan. So um, any primate can obviously carry a lot of diseases that we can catch. So um, these guys, uh, we, we typically wear um, uh, protection just in case we we can catch anything from them so we have to be really careful so all of these guys in zoo medicine um, get tested for TB quite a bit um, and anything that we potentially could catch from any of these um, primates um, so this is the field procedure um, of them setting up so you know they set up anesthesia and intubated this orangutan um, initially um, and then, uh, of course, they got everything 
um, really prepared for um, uh, their procedure as well. So, um, and then here is just a dental um, of a camel. Um, so again, they do a lot of dental procedures and their big reason why is that if any of these animals stops eating, um, they're really not able to help this animal. So um, you'll see in zoo medicine that dentals are done on all of their patients quite frequently. So um, here on the camel, they are actually unable to intubate um, visually so it's all done by palpation so what they can do though is they can actually have a camera that they can um, feed in so that he can actually visually see with the camera so that's what you see on the ground there is just kind of the camera so that he can look um, so different surgeries that they typically do so um, this is actually one of the little owls that she helped um, at the wildlife center so she she actually does like photography on the side so all of these pictures are pictures that she took um, so um, so they do spays and neuters um, on all of the animals that they're not going to be breeding um, fracture repairs, dentals, reptiles, cystotomies, cystectomies, bird stuff, so um, laparoscopic biases, um, egg removals, stuff like that. So these are just surgeries that we would typically see if, you know, they were exotics or obviously spice and dentals we do. So here are some surgical cases that she brought to us. So um, like a GDV, which they typically don't see, but they actually saw one. Um, they had a sinus surgery, an alligator amputation, and an Apollo um, uh, pyometra. So that's the one she wanted to bring to us. So, um, so she was working, um, obviously, a zoo, and they had an adult male who just wasn't acting right and had some um was lethargic and he was retching um he's the leader of the pack so they were like this is kind of weird like why is he so you know lethargic and um the zoo photographer just noticed him drooling um excessively and just looked bloated so um they called the board certified surgeon um and they were like hey you know we just don't feel comfortable doing the surgery um typically in you know regular practice we would just take them on in right away and um, do the surgery, right? But like I said, you have to write up a protocol, you have to get it approved, you have to then be able to, to then get the wolf and, um, and then be able to start everything, right? So they had to write up the protocol and get it approved. So this whole scenario took about 12 hours to do. So um, they did it as quick as they possibly could because this was again on the weekend too. Um, so they finally were able to do everything. They did the GDV surgery. And, you know, Sherry here came from emergency critical care. And wolves are obviously, as you guys know, very their anatomy is just like a dog so it, it shouldn't have been that big of an issue right um so once they were able to get in there and do that then they were fine but um the dog the dog i don't think the, the wolf's doing great so um it just took a really long time so father um is a an adult male he had a lot of ocular nasal discharge and he uh, it was cultured many times, treated with oral antibiotics, and just still wasn't doing well. So they did a CT of the nasal cavity, um, and uh, I believe what they ended up having to do was um, having to go in and take a peek at, um, I think there was a little tumor growing in there. Um, so as you can see, they went in. And this is kind of that sinus area right there. They had to pull that tumor out. Um, so that, yeah, they had to go into that sinus and pull that out. Um, so this is his little head right here. Um, his beak would be down in this area, like towards that gelpy retractor. Um, so that's a pretty big hole. <laughs> Um, and, um, they stitch them all back up, poor little guy, um, and he is now doing fine, so, um, yeah, 
Um, our alligator Buck, um, he uh, didn't have a really good day. Um, he was fighting over some dominance with another alligator and he um, was bit um, in the leg and um, then it was spun. So the other alligator bit his leg and then spun. Um, so it broke his leg. And so they were thinking, should we fix the leg or amputate it? So um, what they ended up doing is they were in the field and um, they decided that they were going to need to transfer him to the hospital um, to actually do anything to him because it was so bad. Um, so what they ended up doing, you can see in the picture here, um, on the right, you can see that break um, on his leg, and it was pretty bad. So, um, and alligators don't heal very well, from my understanding. Um, they have a hard time with leg injuries and in, altogether, um, or injuries in, as well. So, what they did was they drew a bunch of blood on him so that they could run blood work, and if you can tell in this picture. Um, they covered his eyes so that he would behave himself. They had taped up. Oh my gosh. Um, oh my gosh. Eh, now I just went too far. Um, so they taped up his eyes, um, and, um, and they drew his blood from the top of his head. Um, so um, that's how you actually draw blood from a little alligator. Um, so from there, um, they brought him in and um, he uh, ended up having surgery. So they decided that they were gonna amputate his leg. It was really, really infected. It had been, he had been in, um, in uh, his um, uh, his leg had been broken for probably about five days because um, he hid everything really well. Um, so it was really, really um, infected and gross. Um, they placed him on fluids, as you can see in the picture here. Um, they hate intubated him so you missed the Kylie of the picture before where they intubated him um, essentially they had to pry his mouth open because um, alligators have a really really bad lock jaw so what they did was is they took like this uh, really um, this big spoon um, to pry his mouth open and then they intubated him which intubating alligators not hard it's just a matter of getting their mouth open um, so they ended up getting his, um, ampu his leg amputated, so it came off really well. Um, but this is what he looked like postoperatively. Um, and they were really concerned because there was such a bad infection. It looked pretty bad. Um, and he was intubated and everything. Um, and so they had him try to recover, um, but he was having a hard time recovering. He was not recovering very well. Um, they turned him off gas anesthetic and he just was not waking up um, and he just never woke up. So um, yeah, that was the unfortunate part. Um, so I was like, why did you have to put a sad one in there? But um, I guess um, he was just really sick. So um, and then we have our Impala, so eight-year-old female um, intact um, that she um, had a significant amount of discharge coming from her back end, um, and otherwise she was pretty doing pretty well. Um, and then she had obviously cock's eye um, and some uh, squamous epithelial cells, some degenerative neutrophils. Um, they were suspecting a pyometra most likely. Um, they uh, consulted um, to see what they should do, obviously, uh, and then. Um, now the discharge was becoming like brown and gross and whatever, um, and they darted her with some antibiotics, um, you know, just to, just to make sure um, that they were covering everything. Um, 
So they ended up deciding to go to surgery. So they um, anesthetized her, put a, they intubated her, and she's maintaining an isoflurane. They have her on an IV catheter. Her ultrasound showed um, that she had a large tubular structure and um, some weird material present, um, which can be just kind of like chunky, gross, probably mucoid material. Um, so we'll see, right, on her abdominal explored. So this is what her um, spay essentially looked like. So it ended up being a pyometra, um, and it, it's pretty grossly fluid filled. Um, so um, she ended up, um, wait, she ended up uh, waking up okay. Um, but they also had to be incredibly careful with these guys too, I guess. Um, what happens is with these guys is that they have a super, super bad fight or flight um, response, um, especially after surgery. Um, so waking up can be very difficult. Um, so they were really afraid that she was going to essentially freak out um, waking up from surgery, but she ended up doing okay. So. And this is like one of my favorite ones. So my squirrel monkey, Tasha, she um, was a first time mom. And of course on the weekend, right? Um, she uh, had her baby and no placenta was seen. So she was really lethargic and laying on the ground. Um, by the way, my friend took these pictures and videos and stuff. Um, and so here's her just not, not doing well and um, right, we need to have that placenta come out. So finally, her placenta passed, right? So um, that's what it looked like. Um, so they called the vet um, in, uh, and they brought her into the hospital. They masked her down with zeofluorine, got some blood work done, um, and put her on some IV fluids um, and just gave her some medications as quickly as possible and she spent the night in the carrier with her baby in the hospital. So obviously not, not feeling good, right? So the next day, they took her out of the little carrier. It's such look. <laughs> so a lot better, right? So this is how Tasha and Tubak looks now. So beautiful pictures, right? I just love them. So cute. Um, and so she's feeling so much better. So thank goodness that I intervened really fast and got you know, the placenta pass and then just supportive care helps so much. Um, and so, yeah, they're doing really, I just love, I think they're so cute. Um, but training is really important. So granted, we get the, the basics when we go to tech school, right? But training is really important no matter what field you go into. So knowing exactly like what you need to do and then keeping up with that training is really, really, really important. So um, knowing obviously your blood draws, your x-rays, your exams, the injections you give, your urine collection, um, ultrasounds, those basic things that we learn in school, um, it translates to anywhere you go. Um, and no matter what kind of patients you see, right? Um, nutrition is incredibly important, um, again, for whatever animal that we feed, um, supplementing any of our babies and stuff like that, like what is important um, to give them and uh, supplementing the animals that are in need and, and need that extra support um, when they're sick. I mean, they need that energy, so we have to be able to know enough about nutrition. And an enrichment every day is really important. All of these guys in the zoo, they need that enrichment. And it keeps them busy and, um, you know, their minds going. And we need that enrichment, too. Like, it makes our job so much more fun. Um, and same thing for when we work in an animal hospital. Like, 
they enjoy coming back to us um, and it makes our job so much easier to be able to be like, okay, I can do this blood draw because they're more than willing to help us with it. Or I can get this ultrasound done because I'm able to um, distract them or give them treats or they're more than willing to lay down or whatever, you know. Um, daily care, right? So doing their nail trims, being able to um, some of them get baths and stuff, you know, so like just taking care of them um, is really important. And then educational purposes, you know, like knowing about these animals is incredibly important and sharing that knowledge to others is what is going to make the difference in this world. Um, conservation yeah. medicine is so important, but the fact is, is that our zoos aren't there just for entertainment purposes. They're there to actually educate people um, about why these animals are so important and the environment that they live in is so important and why these animals make that environment so important. It's truly, I know it sounds so silly, but um, with Lion King saying it's the circle of life, right? Um, that's what makes the difference and so we have to be the ones to be able to give that knowledge to those people so um here's the stingray um ultrasound as well so she's just showing how um training those stingrays to be able to come over and uh just lay there for their ultrasounds um they they just come up and do it i mean that's like the craziest thing in the world if we can train um, a hyena to come and get their blood drawn like we can be able to do that for a cat and dog in some sort of way not to say that they're willingly going to do that but I'm sure we could be able to make their lives a little bit better in in our blood drawing process right um, and not stress them out as bad um, here's the same thing happening with um, you know our our rhino is that we are at least, um, you know, checking out this patient uh, and not feeling like it's going to kill us. Yeah. Um, we're doing hoof rads on a giraffe, um, and I've actually seen this on TV. I just have them literally put put the hoof on the table over and over and over again, and they do it. It's it's so amazing to actually have them do this. Um, a blood pressure, you know. Um, and then here's an orangutan blood orangutan blood draw.
So that's literally just step by step of how they do um, their little training sessions. And um, that's pretty amazing that they can do that. So um, echocardiograms as well, um, you know, just having them come up and and truly they they get their rewards for just, um, you know, helping out in these medical procedures. It's really awesome. Um, elephant foot rads, which I think are so great. Um, I mean, it's just incredible. These, these awesome large animals are able to make um, just medical treatments for themselves. Uh, just really, really simple. Um, and hyena ultrasound, which is so cool. Um, really, really, really awesome. Um, this is a really great video. It just makes me giggle when I watch it, so this one's fun. Good boy, not yet, though. Hold on. Hold on. Do you just slam it in the side? Yeah. He's ready for you. Good boy. 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 I'm ready. Are you ready? Ready? Yeah. Hip. Hip. Good boy. Oh, no. Oh. Good boy. Good boy. So it just makes me giggle because he just scratched his little hip afterwards. But but he did a really good job, you know, way better than a lot of our patients. So um, and then this is just the fun part, right? All the babies that are seen that makes our our um, you know endangered animals grow and um, the the great work that you know uh, Zoomed is able to do um, is just incredible. So. Um, just these are the enjoyable parts of being able to see. So even more babies that they get to see. I love the little giraffes and, and stuff like that. Um, goat babies. Everybody loves little goat babies. So that's fun. Um, and obviously, so um, things that she said too, like if you want to be a zoo vet tech, um, just knowing that your location, you just never know where you're going to be. Um, there's not a lot of jobs out there. So knowing that um, you could really start out anywhere um, and that your dream job might not come necessarily right away, um, but not being afraid to relocate at first and um, get that experience under your belt um, and then, you know, moving on to a, a different location. So like for her, um, she ended up going uh, first to uh, Phoenix Zoo and then um, now she's in Milwaukee, which is closer to her hometown in Chicago. Um, and then timing is really important too. So, um, you know, you might not get a job right away um but just keep trying um and that um you know it, it's it might just take some time to to find a, a hiring zoo um but don't give up if you really really want to do it um skills are really important um so keep studying keep keep working on your skills um and don't give up on that and then your passion and dedication are really important so um you know, it, that shows. It shows when you are interviewing. It shows when you are working. Um, and they will keep you if they see that passion and dedication. Um, it's not always just about seniority. It's not just about your time being in the vet tech field. Um, seniority just doesn't mean that. You know, it doesn't mean oh, I've been in the field for 30 years, so I just deserve something. Um, it's about passion and dedication as well. Um, and, and what you're willing to do for, for the field. Um, so keep that in mind. And then volunteer. Volunteering is incredibly important. Um, you know, if, if you want to get a vet tech, uh, a zoo job, um, take, you know, even if it's one day a month, um, volunteer somewhere. And even if it's a small zoo, volunteer somewhere. Show that you are dedicated to helping at a zoo no matter what, no matter if you're not even getting paid, no matter if it's just to change out the garbage cans or, you know, just to take tickets or something. But don't be afraid to volunteer, um, even if you're a super busy person. I mean, currently I have two jobs. I'm going to school. I'm working on a specialty. And I'm still volunteering um, for the Green Cross. I mean, that's all volunteer basis. Um, and I volunteer for the VTE um, prep group. You I mean that's all volunteers? So, I mean, don't be afraid to volunteer. It shows that you're dedicated to, you know, your 
what your mission is in life. Um, so don't be afraid to do that kind of stuff. And, and go to conferences, network with people. Um, that's going to also help. They'll, they'll remember your name. They'll remember your passion. They'll remember your face um, so that when something does come up, um, they'll see your resume and remember who you are. So um, keep that in mind.